Hello again and welcome back to another day of daily Bible study. We're finishing up our second to last passage here of, 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 of the book of Acts. Uh, we're in chapter 28. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 11. And now finally, 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 Paul has arrived, is arriving at Rome. Before we look at that passage together, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we have seen you at work in Paul's life uh, in, in so many ways. Uh, we've seen you at work in these early days with these Acts of the Apostles, and there is much that we can learn from. It requires a different kind of discernment because we're not looking at the life of Jesus, God in flesh, but we're looking at these examples of these great witnesses who have gone before us. Lord, help us in the midst of reflecting on all these things to discern what we need to take into our life today uh, and what uh, we, we may cast aside. Uh, but Lord, we need you to move in us, the same Holy Spirit who moved through Paul. We need that same Holy Spirit in our lives too. Lord, watch over us as we consider this passage, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here, starting in verse 11, we read, At the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship, which had wintered at the island and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. As we put in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there, we sailed around and, and arrived at Regium, and a day later, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Putoli. Uh, there we found some brethren, and we were invited to stay with them for seven days, and thus we came to Rome. And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market of Appius, and said, Three, um, three inns... Appius and three, sorry, as the market of Appius and three inns to meet us. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who was guarding him. Uh, after three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And, be, and when they had come together, he began to saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain with the sake, for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for concerning this sect, it is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. So this is a fascinating thing. Paul arrives in Rome. And, and I want to highlight the fact that they, the boat that they have has the, the, was it the twin brothers. These are Castor and Pollux. And it's fascinating. There's a whole weird story about it. One of them, so they're both the children of Zeus, and one of them is immortal, and one of them is not. And there's a whole weird story about all of that. It just makes you wonder why that highlight, why, that def, why that's uh, drawn attention to in this. Um, I don't know if it became a famous ship, or I, I, it, the only thing that comes to my mind is maybe it's drawing attention to this divine and human situation that um, whereas Castor and Pollux, one of them is divine and one of them is human in Greek mythology, in Jesus, we have the one who is divine and human in his own person. I'm not certain. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's certainly not the language of the New Testament in spite of the fact that, it's, that it is, uh, was developed to be as faithful as possible to the New Testament witness. Um, but as fast as Paul goes to Rome and the very first people he meets with uh, when he gets a chance to is he goes and he tries to call together the leading, the leading Jewish leaders, the you know, leading Jewish men. And he wants to be just upfront and say, you, you may have heard about me. You may have heard that I've come and I'm an enemy of Israel, but I want to be with you first of all. Before I talk to the Romans, before I you know, make a defense, you know, I want to talk to you all first so that we can have a heart to heart and we can understand one another. And I can at least make my case before you that, that I'm not here to tear Israel apart. I'm here to support Israel. It's, I'm in chains for the hope of Israel. Um, this idea of the things that God has promised our people over the years I believe they've come to fulfillment. I believe that this hope is real and, and is manifest uh, in Jesus. And that uh, that's the message that I have to say. And, and I want you to realize that it's not because I'm anti-Israel. It's because I'm desperately pro-Israel that I believe that, that, I, that I'm doing what I'm doing. It's because I believe that Israel has been an absolutely crucial you know, aspect to what God has been doing. And that you know, the future of the people of God is based on the promises of, of, that God made to Israel. And so I'm wearing this chain for the sake of this hope, uh, the same hope that you share, you know, and that's so I want to share with you about that. And I just find it a fascinating way that once again, before the Jewish people, he is drawing heavy attention to his Jewish background, his Jewish credentials, and he wants to, he's, he is interpreting the gospel as being um, a particular interpretation of the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And we see early on in church history a tendency that still persists in various forms throughout, throughout all of church history to kind of downplay the Old Testament, to downplay God's historical interaction with the people of Israel. And, and Paul doesn't want that to be the case. And I appreciate that I probably am contributing in my own way to that by looking at all these New Testament texts uh, without necessarily going through the Old Testament. But part of that has had to do with the fact that, um, you know, going through you know, any of the books of the Bible at quite the same level of micro-attention 
Um, I don't know that any of them quite stand up in the same way uh, for daily Christian life. But um, maybe we'll look at something like that when we finish going through uh, the last couple of big books in the New Testament. But in any case, you know, what is fascinating, their response is like, we haven't heard anything about you. So whether they didn't send a message or they sent a message that got caught and delayed by the same um, you know, storms on the sea or whether they, it's just hasn't, they just really still haven't gotten there uh, by land or what. So we haven't heard of you. We know of your people. We know of the Christians. And we know that everyone everywhere is talking against you. So um, we'd like to find out more. You know, find out if we should also be against you. But that is, it is a remarkably open moment. And I think that as Christians, we sometimes want people to be enthusiastically in favor of us and what we stand for. But I think we really ought to be grateful if we can just get an honest hearing. Um, if we can get an honest hearing, we need to trust that God will do the rest. And all I want from people generally is to say, please hear me out. Uh, I've talked before about how I, I've, I've given up trying to get someone to agree with me in the moment. Just hear me out. And, and, and I can trust that God will do some work in the midst of all that. Um, and I don't, I don't need to demand enthusiastic support today. I just want to make a case and let God do the work. Um, so I, just, I find it fascinating that here's Paul, you know, finally getting right before Rome. And it says before he goes to see Caesar, before he makes his case, before the, the leading, uh, you know, powers that be in Rome, he wants to, to talk to the Jewish people. Once again, prioritizing uh, God's mission uh, over, you know, the secular powers. I think it's a vitally important thing we, re- we always remember. Well, that's all for today. Come back tomorrow. We'll have one more day of Daily Bible study and one more day of the Book of Acts. Have a good day.